Calvary Chapel, Mason City. The Lord. Desmond Doss is known by some. Maybe you're familiar with his story. His is a story of a person who believed and therefore stood on his beliefs. And when the time came for him to rise to the occasion and live out what he believed in a difficult situation, he did. During World War II, he enlisted in the army as a conscientious objector. He refused to carry a weapon due to his religious beliefs, but he wanted to serve his country and help his fellow soldiers. Doss was initially mocked and mistreated by his fellow soldiers for his refusal to bear arms, but he remained steadfast in his convictions. Doss was eventually sent to the front lines of the battle in Okinawa, Japan. During one particularly intense battle, Doss's company was ordered to retreat, but he stayed behind to tend to the wounded. He single-handedly carried 75 soldiers that were wounded to safety, lowering them down an incredibly steep cliff. He did it all without firing a single shot. His incredible bravery and selflessness earned him the Medal of Honor, the highest military award given in the United States. This guy believed, and when it came time to rise to the occasion, to stand on what he believed, he did it. You guys have probably seen the movie, it's Hacksaw Ridge, right? I don't recommend that if you have a weak stomach. <laughs> Very interesting movie. So, rising to the occasion to live out the things that you believe. Wrapping up this wonderful, powerful little letter here today, we've learned that being a follower of Jesus is not just another philosophy or some religion. It's about a new life. And this new life affects the way that we live, as we saw last time, as Paul exhorted the Colossians to fulfill our roles. Now, today, this exhortation continues to stand firm in Christ, to live out the life that he desires for us, to rise to the occasion to live in the way that God desires. That's the title of the message, Rising to the Occasion, Living the Life that Christ Has for Us. Now, as we remember, this letter is not about making something happen in your own strength. This is where a lot of people are confused about Christianity. They think, I need to make this all happen in my own strength. This message in this letter and in through the whole Bible is that God himself comes inside and lives in you gives you new desire, a new power, a new life, and then the exhortations are to live in accordance with what that life is. And that's why you read the Bible is to figure out what that new life is all about so you know how to rise to the occasion and to live as Christ would have you live. Since God empowers us to stand firm in Christ, there are three things we'll see in this message you can see on the outline. We must persevere in prayer, maintain our witness outwardly, and build up the body of Christ. Those three things. We must persevere in prayer, number one. Look at verse two. He says, continue earnestly in prayer. In other words, always maintain the habit of prayer. Now, like someone devotes themselves to taking care of their body, or some other discipline, this is what he is getting at here. Christians are to discipline themselves to pray. Now, it's interesting, in 10 years of being a pastor, I've taught a lot of messages where God is telling people to pray, and you've heard the pastor over and over again saying, you should pray more, you should pray more. And, you know, there's just really no way around it that the Bible calls people to pray. The Apostle Paul, he had a very mature prayer life right? There are at least 17 places in the New Testament where Paul is either praying or talking about prayer. And so he lived what he exhorted other people to do, right? And he uh, exhorts other Christians to continue earnestly. Where it says continue earnestly, that has the idea of being devoted to something. And do you know what it's like to be devoted to something? I mean, everybody knows, right? Like I'm pretty devoted to checking the notifications on my phone, right? I'm pretty devoted to, uh, you know, I wish I was more devoted to going to the gym. <laughs> you know, I'm getting better at it. My wife is giving me a run for my money. Um, you know what it's like to be devoted to things, right? You might be devoted to new kids on the block. And so you've got their poster, you've got Joey on the wall, you know, I mean, you don't even know what that means these days. 
You might be devoted to your favorite band, your favorite YouTube influencer. You might be devoted to your favorite video game. You know what it's like to be devoted. And Paul says, as a Christian, you ought to be devoted to prayer. And that's what he's getting at here. And he says, also, as you're devoted to this, as you're continuing earnestly in it, the next part of verse 2, he says, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Now, being vigilant, another thing is you could say being aware, right? In prayer, we should be alert and aware, but it's so easy to become like drowsy and unaware. I mean, is that not the case? It's hard to pray. Satan hates prayer. That's why when you try to pray, all of this stuff starts coming against you. Now, anybody that's ever tried to be obedient to Jesus and pray as, as we ought has experienced the spiritual attack. Let's put it this way. If you want to know that you have a real adversary as a Christian, try to commit to a prayer life. See what happens. Right? That's why Paul, he doesn't, he doesn't skirt around the issue. He says, you need to be devoted to it. That means you have to make a choice to be devoted to this spiritual discipline. Right? And he says also with thanksgiving in it. So that's being constantly motivated and mindful of all we have to be thankful for in Christ. Well, why should I be praying? Because I'm thankful for what God's done for me in Christ. And I want to engage in his kingdom work. I'm thankful that he saved me. And he goes on in verses three through four, and he says, so first of all, we should be devoted to prayer. And now that we should pray for opportunities to uh, proclaim the gospel, look at verse three, he says, meanwhile, praying for us also, Paul's telling the Colossians, meanwhile, you as a church should be praying for us also, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. Now you remember he was in prison for preaching and teaching about Jesus. When he says open a door, he's praying that, he's asking the Colossians to pray for opportunities to share the gospel and talk about Jesus with those who need him. What does that look like when God opens a door? Are you familiar with that? Can you think of some times in your life, like you say, I know this, these are times where God opened a door. Opening a door is when God arranges some sort of opportunity where you have the invitation now to talk about Christ. Something happens and God opens up this opportunity. And if, you've, if you're following Jesus, you have, you're familiar with how this works. Maybe with a family member or a friend, or maybe you're asked to share in church your testimony or something, or maybe online even, maybe in a chat room. This is an opportunity maybe to go on a missions trip. It's opportunity to go evangelize maybe with others. This is when God opens a door. It's maybe you're at the gas station and somebody, you know, you notice that there's this opportunity for you to share Jesus with them. Paul says that we ought to pray for things like that as Christians. We ought to, I mean, if you want to see God answer a prayer, pray that one every day. God, would you open up opportunities for me to share the gospel? It is overwhelming what happens to your life, right? A lot of people say God doesn't answer prayer, but the Bible tells us why God doesn't answer prayer. He says in the book of James, he says, God does not answer his prayers that are for yourself, right? I mean, he meets our needs, but he says a lot of things that we ask is just selfishly so we can spend it on our desires, right? There's nothing wrong for praying for your spiritual needs to be met and praying that God would help you to live the life that Christ has called you to, you know, to rise to the occasion. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you start praying for opportunities to be about Jesus' business, you'll see God start opening doors, right? He says that I want to proclaim uh, the mystery of Christ. So open doors for Paul to be able to talk about how Christ comes and lives in you. Remember, he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, a couple of messages ago. That's the mystery of Christ, that God comes and lives inside of you. That Christianity isn't just some religion or some code of beliefs. It's God himself living in you. He says that he wants to speak that, for which I am also in chains, he's in prison, that I, might, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Make it manifest means that Paul is asking for people to pray for him, that when he preaches the gospel, that it would be visible, that they would be able to see it, that they would be able to understand it. He says, I want the gospel to be made manifest. Great prayer for teachers, right? When I'm sharing the gospel, well, Lord, please help me to make it plain, you know, right? And he says, as I ought to speak. Now, notice the word ought. Paul is bound by some sense of duty as a Christian, he says, I ought to speak this. I ought to preach the gospel. Now, 
First of all, God empowers us to stand firm in Christ. And so therefore, we must persevere in prayer. That's our first point. Will we rise to this occasion? That brings us to a very personal question for you today. As a Christian, will you decide, if you haven't already, will you decide to devote yourself to prayer? That is a very personal question that is brought to all of us here today. Will you decide to devote yourself to it? It's a choice. I'm going to give you some extremely practical help, right? Because some of us are like, man, I really struggle with this. I want to get in the habit of prayer. Here, here's a, I printed this out too. So if you can't take notes fast enough, which I understand, so that's why I printed this out. You can come grab one of these from me after the sermon. And I just, I'm not going to come force it on you. So you can come grab it if you want it. But let me just run through a brief version of it. If you want to start the habit of prayer, okay, First of all, set a clear and measurable goal, right? If you're into goal setting and being productive with your life, you already know how this concept works. Like if you set a vague goal, you're not going to hit it, right? I want to pray more. Okay, well, here's the proper question then. When do you want to pray more? How much do you want to pray more? What day of the week do you want to pray? What do you want to pray about, right? These are practical questions that take it out of this like, "Eh, I'll try, to actually, I really want to do something. I really want to put my money where my mouth is as a Christian, right? When will I pray? How will I pray? Make a clear, measurable goal. Like if you're into running, you say, look, I want to train for the 5K. You've got the goal in mind, right? And so you say, I'm going to do this this day of the week. This next week, I'm going to add this much more. I'm going to do, you know, intervals of sprinting. And you've got this clear plan in your mind because you're devoted to it, right? Right? Now, let me exhort you really strongly. Some of you may have been talking about this for years and years and years, right? Saying you're going to do something, saying, I, you know, I know what it's like. So this is a way. Start by making a clear, measurable goal. Now, let me give you the second principle, okay? Start small. Now, maybe your goal is to pray 30 minutes a day, seven days a week. Good goal. Good place. You know, it's a good place for a Christian to be. But why don't you start with 30 seconds three days a week, right? Start small. Now, write a list with three things on it, okay? And I'll even give them to you. You could put this on there. Number one, pray for your relationship with God to deepen and to grow and that he would stretch you, right? Some of you are like, I don't want to pray that. (laughs) Well, Next, pray for the spiritual health of your family and friends, you know, maybe for their salvation, maybe for their growth, maybe for them to come out of a backslidden, lazy place, whatever it would be, for the spiritual health of your friends and family. And then number three, pray for the needs of the church that you are part of. Pray for the spiritual needs, the material needs, all of the needs of the church that God has called you to be a family member. So you've got three things on your list now. Now you can dedicate 10 seconds a day to each of these three things for three days a week. Simple, right? Your goal is, you know, maybe to pray 30 minutes, seven days a week, but you're starting with 30 seconds, three times a week, and now you've got three things to pray. You dedicate 10 seconds to each of these things, right? Now, here's the next thing. Set some reminders in your phone or some triggers, right? Write out this Bible verse on a note card and go and put it in your car, put it in your cubicle, put it in your shower. Well, maybe not in your shower <laughs> Put it on your mirror and your, you know, put it on the, so it's the first thing you see when you wake up. Trigger yourself to remember this, right? Write down the prayer requests, print them off and put them all over the place and trigger it, right? Everybody, you know, puts, you know, cookies on their counter and they get triggered to eat those things. It's the same principle. You're triggering yourself to eat, you know, to pray, you know, you're, you're using the same principles of habits, Right? Now, the next thing would be to get an accountability partner, right? Men, after church today, you could just go up to another man here and just say, look, I want to commit myself to this. Like, I want to be about it, you know? And so would you hold me accountable? And then give that man permission to, at the end of the week, text you and say, how'd you do on your goals, right? And then if you failed, the man says, you know, get back on the horse and do it again. And that's, you know, the next, you know, I would do guys and guys and girls and girls, you know, that's just a good practice in the church. Next one, last one, bathe this all in grace, right? You're doing this out of thankfulness for what God has done, 
right? You want to live the life that Christ has called you to. You want to rise to the occasion because you are so grateful for what God's done for you. That's why you want to do this. You want to make the most of your Christian life. You don't, do you just want to kind of peter out at the end of your life? You know what I mean? Or do you want to like go across the finish line like, man, I did something for Christ. How do you want to do it? Right? Because it starts by you making a choice right now. Right? Am I just going to you know, fizzle? That's comfortable. I don't want to live a life like that, man. Jesus gave it all for me. I want to give it all for him, right? And if that's you, I've, these are some simple ways to start. So you bathe it in grace, and you remember that you're doing this out of thankfulness. If you miss an appointment, don't, uh, don't beat yourself up. Just don't miss two appointments, right? Now, celebrate with your accountability partner. You have a good week, then you tell your accountability partner, I did it, and then they're like, yeah, high five, bro. And then, you know, they do a text message, high five or something, or whatever. And then most of all, know that you are living as God designed you and you're growing in a deepening relationship with him. I'm gonna give you one more bonus, okay? If you like TV, it's simple. Just pray for 30 seconds before you start watching the show. Just break out your prayer list. Just before you're going to start watching, you know, Mr. Belvedere or Three's Company or whatever you do, uh, you know, real, you know, yeah, I don't know shows anymore. Anyway, <laughs> obviously, right? Just, just pray for like, you know, 30 seconds before you start watching your show or afterwards. You know, if you can't wait to get to your show, you know, just pray afterwards, then, right? If you like uh, social media, just pray a little bit before you start, you know, scrolling away through, through Snapchat. You know what I mean? Just, just take 30 seconds. I mean, if you prayed 30 seconds every time that you got your phone out, you'd be a prayer warrior, right? I mean, think about it. It's that easy to start living in these ways, being obedient to God, seeing the spiritual power of God coming into your life. You want spiritual power in your life? Are you willing to devote yourself? Because this is how it comes. Prayer is super important for us to grow spiritually. It's like breathing is to our body. We need to be healthy. We don't just pray once in a while. We make it a regular part of our life, and it gets woven into the fabric of the time that we spend here on this earth. Since God empowers us to stand firm in Christ, we must rise to the occasion and persevere in prayer. Next, we must maintain our witness outwardly. That's number two. Colossians 4, 5 says, walk in wisdom towards those who are outside. So in other words, be wise in your behavior toward non-Christians. Be wise in your behavior toward non-Christians. Now, do you realize that a Christian's conduct can either draw people to Christ or push them away? Right? There are some Christians that are just weird. You know what I'm saying? Some of them just like everywhere you go, you're like, they're just like, amen, brother. And they're prophesying. And, and they're, you know, it's like the unbelieving world just thinks, dude, I could never be part of that. That's too weird. You know, um, it's one of the things I like about Calvary Chapel is it's just like down to earth, regular people following Jesus. You know, um, you're like, no, you're pretty weird. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nobody's weird to themselves, right? Think about it, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Remember Paul says, don't speak in tongues in the, in the general assembly because people will think you're out of your mind, right? You ever brought somebody to church when you used to go to a crazy Pentecostal church and you're like, oh, I hope he doesn't start doing this stuff again, you know? And the, you know what I mean? And uh, the lady in the front stands up and is like, I got a word from the Lord. Blah, 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 and you're like, uh, this place is nutty, man. That's why Paul says, do that stuff in private, you know? Do that stuff with a group of believers, right? So people are drawn to Christ, not pushed away from him. Now, they're on the other side, they're, a, you know, they're Christians so fanatical, everybody thinks they're weird. On the other side, maybe you're like little Jared. And little Jared, his Sunday school teacher to him said one day, man, you're really doing great in Sunday school. You're one of the best students in here. And he says, yeah, and you know what's so great is when I go to school Monday, nobody even knows. Maybe you're like that guy. Your conduct doesn't even draw anybody to Christ because you're so concerned about covering it up because you're more interested in pleasing man than you are in pleasing God. Now, some Christians live ungodly, unholy lives, and I will tell you what, the world thinks you are a joke, man. And I hate to be all hardcore, but when, when people that don't know anything about Christianity see a Christian not living like a Christian, they know that that's wrong, you know? And they say, I, that's why I don't go to churches because it's filled with hypocrites like you. And you're just like, well, 
You know, I thought I was being relatable by being like the world around me. You're actually just a bad witness. Some Christians are like sour grapes. They're harsh and condemning, always pointing out what's wrong with every single thing rather than advertising how wonderful Jesus is. You ever get around Christians like that? They'll tell you all day long how all oh, the world's coming, ungodliness, the wrath of God is upon man, and it's about to, you better repent. And, you know, it's like, okay, do you know anything good about Jesus? You know, like, like give me a reason. <coughs> give me a good reason. Give me a positive reason. You know, stop complaining. You know, if, if there's one thing that's true in 2023, it's that people do not care about complaints, Right? I mean, you people that spend a lot of time on social media, what do you do when somebody's a complainer? Like, I don't have time for that. You know what I mean? We're in this world where people are creating content. They're putting it on YouTube. They're putting it out there. How much content do you watch where it's somebody complaining? I never watch that stuff. I want to hear about, let's get somewhere. Let's set goals. Let's be positive. Let's do the right thing, right? Add some value to the world. Stop complaining so much. You know, there's Christians that are like that. Some Christians are lazy and bored with their life in Christ. And you look at them and you say, man, how come it is that some Christians like do cartwheels over Jesus, but we got to put the paddles on you, bro. <laughs> you know, like, boom, like, like, come on, man, let's go. Like, don't, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? I mean, how could you know him and not be excited by him? You don't know him if you're not excited by him. You just don't know him. And some Christians make, you know, make it look like it's just this lazy, terrible thing to follow Jesus, you know? Then there are people that live appealing lives. They seem to know how to deal with difficulties really well. They suffer well. They seem to know how to deal with their finances. They seem to know how to, you know, be a good employee. They seem to know how to be good students in school. They seem to, like, not have sex before marriage. They're, like, leading, leading clean lives. They're admirable people that are excelling in what they're doing, you know, and you say, that's appealing, man. I want to follow Jesus because I look at all these ways to live and it's like this Christian, this real Christian that I know makes it look very appealing to be a Christian, right? They're not engaged in gossip. They're not engaged in tearing things down, tearing people down. They're not engaged in the filth that is just continuously spewed out in this world. They're just not engaged in that kind of stuff. You get around them and you start to feel positive, like we're going somewhere, like something's happening, Right? That's what he's getting at. You need to be wise as a Christian in your conduct as far as outsiders are concerned. You've got to maintain that witness. He goes on to say in verse 5, redeeming the time. This time uh, th that's referred to here is Kairos. Notice that book, the Kairos adventure. That's what the book is about is exactly redeeming the time. Now, the word redeeming is a Greek word that means to buy out of, ex agorazo. The agora was the marketplace. X means to come out of. So it means to buy out of the marketplace. That's what they used to do with slaves. Ex agorazo. They would buy the slave out of the marketplace. That's what the word means. And so he says, ex agorazo, the kairos. Buy up the opportunities. Buy up the opportunities to share Jesus with people. Take advantage of the opportunities. Maintain relationships with people for the, for the purpose of saying, I want to see you get saved. Isn't that kind of like shifty? No, it's the most important thing that anybody could ever experience would be salvation from hell and sin and death. And so you think it would be shifty to maintain relationships with people, to model Jesus to them? You don't know Jesus if that's what you think. No. You could use your social media platforms to buy up the opportunities for Jesus. You could take people to see Jesus Revolution. It's in the theater for the next week. You could take your unbelieving friends to go see this movie that's all about Christ and portrays Christ in a way that is filled with grace and mercy and shows that the barrier is just not there. You can come right to Jesus and you can take advantage of the fact that they spent millions of dollars to make this movie to try to reach people. You can buy up the opportunities as a Christian, right? Notice how this is all going together. Pray, be vigilant, be you know, attentive, be awake, be on fire, redeem the time, right? All of this stuff is going together. He's talking about rising to the occasion as a Christian. Let your speech be gracious and seasoned with salt, verse 6. Now, when you have speech that's filled with grace, that's speaking truth, love, wisdom, with kindness and humility. Your speech is seasoned with grace. 
probably not like the Westboro Baptist Church out on the street corner with their signs that says God hates you know, this group or that group. I won't even say what it says on their atrocious signs. It's probably not like that. It's probably being a person that speaks with kindness and mercy and love and gives people the benefit of the doubt, isn't judging people all the time. Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. That's speech filled with grace. And he also says, seasoned with salt. So what this means is you always carry a salt shaker around with you. And when you get into a conversation, you just start shaking salt everywhere. And people think you're a crazy weirdo. No, that's not what that means. You knew that didn't mean that. Today, when somebody is salty, it's not a good term, right? You want to stay away from people that are salty. They're all bitter, you know, like they're just like got a problem. They're complaining all the time. You're like, oh, dude, that guy's salty. You know, he's been offended. That's not what this means. This means, you know, think about what, what does salt do? Preserves. It's purifying. Uh, somebody that's speaking with salt preserves the conversation, right? You go up and there's a conversation about like gossip and about illicit stuff going on and evil. You're, you're at your job and they're talking about what they did all weekend. And you walk up and, you know, some Christians are like, I just don't even want to hear anything about that. But other Christians come and they start talking about what they did this weekend. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was at Sunday school teaching kids. I was at church, you know, witnessing uh, with my friends and we were praying together. We prayed for Morocco and all of a sudden, this saltiness of this conversation starts purifying this gossip, filthy, R-rated conversation. Notice how that works? My grandfather was so great at this. We used to work on a milk route together and we would pull up to certain places and I would watch people's mouths just shut as they saw my grandpa, you know, because he was salty. Like he had a preservative purifying effect and they just, they didn't feel comfortable carrying on that sort of conversation in the presence of a, of a guy that was walking in holiness, right? God help us. Salt also adds flavor to stuff that's otherwise lifeless. You ever had stovetop with no salt? I don't like it. It adds flavor. Christians should be adding flavor to life, right? It only takes a little bit to make an impact, but too much is too much, right? How about this? It leaves people thirsty. Hmm. The way you talk about Jesus, I want to know that Jesus. He says that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Now, this is interesting. That you may know implies knowledge, right? That you may have the knowledge of how to speak to unbelievers. Notice the word ought. That implies a sense of duty. That you might have the knowledge of how to speak to people because you have this sense of it's my duty to speak to unbelievers about Jesus and answer each one. That tells you that it's not a one-size-fits-all thing. You combine all those things together and you see what we're doing evangelism training here coming up, right? Because we're going to learn how to speak to people, right? This implies, you, you might say, well, I don't know how to speak to people about Jesus. Listen, with all due respect, that, you can't use that excuse as a Christian, you know? You can't even use that excuse in anything in life today because you can just go Google stuff and go learn how to do it. You know what I mean? You can go to Google and learn how to tie, like, you know, how to braid your hair in all kinds of different ways, you know what I mean? And, but, you, but you can't figure out how to talk about Jesus to different people, you know? Uh, let me give you a uh, a little hint, you know, you could watch debates. You ever watch debates? Like you watch a Christian apologetics guy like debate with an atheist, you know, Dawkins versus uh, William Lane Craig, something like that, you know. Um, what's the guy, Cold Case Christianity, what's his name? Yeah, that guy. You can go online and literally watch him debate, and, or you can watch his videos where he teaches people how to talk to others about Jesus, right? That's like his whole ministry is teaching people how to talk about Jesus, you know? All kinds of ways that a Christian can go learn. That, blessed, blessed be the Lord, right? There's so many materials, so many ways to learn. This is awesome. Now, you can really grow in this. This is a skill of how you maintain your witness to outsiders. It's a skill. I should give some thought to how I come off to other people. If you want something really practical, let me give you a baby step practical application here. If you're married, ask your spouse to give you an honest assessment of how your life makes Jesus look to the community. 
I'm not trying to cause a fight in your marriage, <laughs> but maybe if this does cause a fight, maybe you need to have one, you know? But have your spouse do an honest assessment of your walk and how people perceive it. Because nobody knows you better than your spouse does. Your spouse can tell you right now. If you're not married, just go around and just pay attention to your interactions with everybody for a week and write them down in a journal and say, you know, if I had to, you know, say, did I draw people to Jesus or did I push them away or was I neutral? Just do an audit of yourself. What does Mason City, Iowa think about Jesus based on your interactions with people at the grocery store, gas station, library, doctor's office? It's a good thing to think about. Since God empowers us to stand firm in Christ, we must rise to the occasion. We must persevere in prayer, maintain our witness outwardly, and finally build up the body of Christ. As Paul concludes this letter, he does it in a typical way, and he goes through a greeting like to all these different people. And it's kind of an interesting study if you want to go and read these people's names and figure out who they are. I'm not going to go way in depth, but I'm going to look at it from the standpoint of we should be building up the body of Christ because essentially all of these people that he mentions, they were all working together to build up the body of Christ. Now, he starts out by saying, Tychicus, a beloved brother, These are Paul's friends. These are Paul's ministry partners. And I just want you to notice how he talks about Tychicus to start out with. He calls him a beloved brother. Do you men have good friendships? Do you have friendships where somebody looks at you as a beloved brother? Do you, do you have guy friends that love you? Because you need him, man. Paul, one thing you can say about Paul is he planted more churches probably than anybody. Maybe not more than Chuck Smith, to be honest. <laughs> but I mean, it's another conversation. We were thinking about Chuck's reception to heaven and how Paul and <laughs> Peter and everybody were probably like, Chuck, whoa, 1,800 churches, man, whoa, you know? Most humble dude ever, though, right? Anyway, guys, Paul was not a lone ranger. He had friends. He had beloved brethren. He had people that he loved, that loved him. And that's a very important thing. This culture, this world is trying to squeeze men into this mold of where you work, you pay the bills, and you sacrifice, and you don't have real connections with people, and you don't have real life going with people, and you're isolated. And, and the Bible says that a man that seeks his own, uh, that seeks to isolate himself, seeks his own desire, right? That's not the will of God for you to be a loner. It's, look at, he calls him a beloved brother. He also calls him a faithful minister. I love that. The number one thing that is important in your ministry is faithfulness. It's not talent. It's not good looks. It's not eloquence. It's not skill. It's faithfulness. God can build all of those other things into you. Maybe not the good looks, but he can build everything else. <laughs> that was a little joke, right? They don't, he, he could. Faithfulness. Fellow servant, he says that right there. Now, this is important. The word fellow servant, I want you to notice, I don't think I have the verses on the screen, so you have to look in your own Bible, but in describing Tychicus in verse 7, it says that he's a uh, fellow servant. So Paul, it's a very important concept. Paul put himself on the same level as everybody else in the body of Christ. The whole like hierarchy of popes, and priests, and the laity, and the ministry didn't start until about 300 AD, right? That came in later from the Roman Catholic Church. They systematized it, they corporatized it, and they made it to where these are the people in the robes, and these are the people in the pews. And it was not like that in the early church. Everybody in the early church was brothers and sisters, right? Now, there are some older brothers. There are some people that have been a little bit further than you, and they're going to disciple you and help you, but everybody's on the same level. Nobody has rank over other people, right? It wasn't set up like that. That's a very important note right there, because today the church in America looks at it as like, we sit in the chairs and he talks, but that is, that's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is every one of you has been given a place to fulfill in the kingdom of God and in the body of Christ. You all have a mission from him, every single one of you. Now, 
says that Tychicus will know their circumstances and comfort their hearts. So those are two things where this man of God built up the body of Christ. He knew their circumstances. He was concerned enough to talk to them, to get to know them. And he comforted their hearts. What a ministry, right? What a faithful ministry to get to know people and then comfort their hearts, encourage them. Man, dudes like that are gold. Onesimus, the next guy that's mentioned there you see in your Bible. Faithful, he's called, beloved. Also, this guy was a runaway slave that stole money from his master in Colossae, ran away to Rome to try to hide, runs into the apostle Paul while he's in jail, gets saved, and then Paul sends him back to Colossae. He says, you know what? You should go make right with your, uh, you know, with your slave master. You stole money from the guy. He's like, you're a Christian now. You go back there and you just take ownership for it. Which is some of you are like, hey, this is the book of Philemon. It is. I just gave you the clue, man. There you go. But notice this about Onesimus. He stole money from a Christian. He took off. He ran away. He gets reconciled to him, and he comes back, and he's part of it. That builds up the body of Christ, reconciliation, right? Next one's in verse 10, Aristarchus and Mark. Now, I'm just going to comment on Mark here. This is the same Mark that in the book of Acts had a falling out with the Apostle Paul. You remember that? Mark was maybe like, you know, we don't really know why. Maybe he was kind of just young and scared. But Paul was going to get into some serious ministry. And Barnabas was like, we got to take Mark, my cousin, with us. And, uh, Bar- and Mark fled. Mark deserted the ministry, you know. It's like he just did a no-call, no-show one morning. And he was done with it. And so then another trip came around. And Barnabas was like, we should take my cousin Mark. And Paul's like, nope. I'm not going with him because I can't trust him, you know, at this point. But look here, we're all the way back later on, and they've reconciled. You see that? That builds up the body of Christ. Family. Verse 11 says they are fellow workers. There again, that's that same point. They're all fellow workers. We're all in the kingdom of God together, all of us here, and we're all working together, and we all have a calling. Verse 12, Epaphras, who's one of you, look what it says there. It says that he labors fervently for you in prayers. Do you know what the word fervently means? It means with heat, fervor. This guy labors fervently in prayer for the Colossians. That builds up the body of Christ. When a man labors fervently. I like how he uses that word labors because just, that tells you that it's easy, right? <laughs> it's not easy. It's laborious. Almost anybody can pray for their own needs and you should, but that comes natural. That comes easy. God help me. But laboring for other people, that's labor. And so Epaphras is noted for doing that. It also goes on to say in um, verse 12, verse 13 here, that he had great zeal. Do you see that in your Bible? This man had great zeal for the church. He got himself excited about ministering to other people, laboring fervently in prayer and serving them. He cultivated a zeal in himself. You know, some people look at some Christians and they say, man, that guy's just so zealous. I'm nothing like that. Did you ever stop to think that maybe he cultivated that zeal? He got himself excited about that which Christ is excited about? And he says that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's what he was praying for, that they might stand perfect and complete in the will of God. He seeks to know and do God's will, and he prays the same for them. Now, verses 13 through 18, sorry, 14 through 18, fulfilling the call God has for you to love and serve the body. 
I'm going to point out a guy that we're going to conclude kind of with this guy. His name's Archippus. And uh, a lot of baby names in this last category, right? So you're going to, you know, this is my new baby. He's so cute. His name's Tychicus. <laughs> really? He says in verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Now that's Luke that wrote the gospel of Luke. What else did he write? Book of Acts. That's right. Now, that's that same Luke. He's the beloved physician. Second Timothy says that Luke was with Paul all the way to the end. Right before Paul got his head chopped off in Second Timothy, the end of his life, Luke was still there. And uh, Demas, right? Now, have you ever seen the shirt going around on social media that says, don't be a Demas? Has ever seen that? So uh, let, me, let me share that one with you today. Don't be a Demas. Do you know what he did? It doesn't say here, but do you know what he did? He was faithful still here. But it says in other scriptures that he deserted the apostle Paul because he was in love with the things of the world. Don't be a Demas. <laughs> but here he was doing okay. He goes on to say, greet the brethren who are in Laodicea. It's another city that's in this Lycus Valley next to uh, uh, Colossae. Nymphus and the church in his house. Your translation might say Nymphus and the church in her house. Uh, Bible nerd, there's a debate whether this was a male or female name. You know, somewhat, of, I guess it's kind of interesting, but one translation says one, one translation says another. Notice what he says. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also, uh, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now, the epistle from Laodicea, are we missing a book of the Bible? Not likely. So these letters were read in a round robin sort of style, and Laodicea was the last on the list. So if a letter is being passed around, and it goes finally to Laodicea, that may be what he's getting at here, most likely. And so that's probably the letter of the Ephesians. It goes around to all the churches. It ends up in Laodicea. And then he says, read the letter from Laodicea, right? This letter's coming to the Colossians. He says, you know, have this read around. But you also read the epistle to the Laodiceans. It's probably the Ephesians. Now, I've given you both of the extra credit points. I mean, right here, if you couldn't figure them out, you know, good thing it's not a rattlesnake. Now notice this gentleman here, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Now a Bible student says, why does this guy need to be told to take heed? Well, it doesn't tell us exactly, but there's for some reason this guy needed what my pastor calls a sanctified kick in the butt. Right? There are some people that they just need to hear that. Listen, God has given each one of us a calling. And somebody, this is a message for you today. I know it. You need to take heed to the ministry that God has given you and stop letting it be on the back burner. You need to do that, just like Archippus need to do it, needed to do it. There are times where Christians get confused about what should be top priority. There are times, and the world is flinging stuff at us all the time that either looks great and shiny or else it's really difficult, and that wants to take our eyes off of what's really important. But what is really important is fulfilling that which God has called you to do in your marriage, in your family, at your workplace, in this community. You have a calling from God, and you are to fulfill it. And you need to take heed to that ministry which belongs uniquely to you. It's your ministry. God created you for it, and you need to take heed to it. You say, how do I find out what this is? Let me give you something very practical. The very next need that comes across your awareness, meet that need. Start serving. Say, oh, I don't know. I don't know what title it is that I'm supposed to be doing. Am I supposed to be in the children's ministry? Am I supposed to be a singer? Am I supposed to do... Here, the very next need that you see that God opens your eyes to, somebody needs help, somebody needs something, serve, meet that need. It's hard to steer a parked car, but if you get the car moving, this is how finding the will of God for your life works. As you get moving, you say, Jesus, I want to be obedient. I want to fulfill my calling. And he starts showing you things. He says, well, well, I'll be darned. Here's an opportunity to help. I saw cigarette butts on the, side, uh, the sidewalk outside. I decided, you know, I don't think the church should look like this. Why don't I get down and 
pick those things up. You're on your way, you know? When people come into this church and they say, I want to serve and I don't care where it's at, give me a toilet brush, give me, I don't care where it's at, I just want to serve Jesus. That's a person that has discovered Christ. They've discovered, they're, they're on their way to discovering more and more about their calling, right? That's how it works. Archippus needed that exhortation, take heed to the ministry.